G'day fellas. In this video, we're going to be looking at decks. We're going to be looking at the mindset behind a deck. We're going to be looking at what a good deck is. And we're just going to be looking at general philosophy of the decks with a focus on how to make the best deck possible for the situation that you're in. Now, I do want to apologize in advance. This is a on the fly video. There's not going to be any editing in this video. So if you hear me breathing, I apologize in advance. If I make any mistakes, please don't leave them in the comments for me to read later. Thank you very much. So there's two different mindsets when it comes to deck making. The first one is the more simplistic mindset, which is that, you know, you should really only have one or two decks and that those decks should be flexible and that you should be able to utilize the cards in those decks for any situation. The second idea, which is the one that I subscribe to, is the specialized deck. I've got a deck for every single situation. Now, I don't have a deck for every single matchup, but if a matchup tends to play a certain way, I'm going to have a deck that's focused towards that matchup. So, let's jump into it. We're going to begin. Uh, the first things first, you're always going to have permanent cards. These are cards that with your civilization, you're always going to be including in all of your decks. It doesn't matter if it's a land deck. It doesn't matter if it's a water deck. It doesn't matter if it's 1v1 or 3v3. These are the cards that are always going to be in your deck. So because it's a new civilization, Sweden is the civilization I've decided that I'm going to be focusing on today. I've been really enjoying playing a lot of Sweden and I'm very comfortable with where they are. So let's begin. Now, I prefer to sort my cards instead of by age, by card type. I'm a little bit more traditional, uh, and that's why I prefer to do that. So the very first card that I'm going to be including in my permanent cards is 700 wood. This is a card that you're going to need no matter what. You may not even send it, this, but you will always find yourself in a situation where you could send it. Whether it's an extra barracks, some extra houses, a trading post, there's always something that you can be spending your wood on. That's the only real core card for the Swedes that is on this page. On the next page, the Military Academy, the next cards that you're going to be looking at are your Age 2 cards. So the primary ones here are the two Leather Cannons, the eight Pikemen, and the eight Crossbows. Now, I play many, many games where I don't send any of these cards at all, and that's perfectly okay. The trick here is that you need to include these cards in your deck because you need to be flexible. What happens if you're up against a certain person and you're expecting a strategy that's going to come out of them and they switch it on you? You need to have these bad boys ready to go. It's so imperative that even if you're expecting to boom, you keep most of these cards in your deck. So the next cards that we're going to be looking at is the two Falconets. Two Falconets is a core card for most civilizations and that does not change with the Swedes. The Swedes rely on this card very, very heavily and as a consequence, it means that we're going to include it in every single deck that we've got. For the Cathedral, it's important that we include Blueberries. Blueberries is a card that I am a big fan of. I'm going to be doing a video that focuses specifically on Blueberries versus the Three Settler card and looks in depth about which one's better. But in my mind, I've already made that decision. And for me, that decision is blueberries is, is the key. I take it very early. I make sure that all the torps that I've got are going to be having this card. But it doesn't mean that I don't include three settlers in some decks. In some decks, I do include three settlers. In some, in some games, I do take three settlers over blueberries. But it doesn't mean that I don't keep blueberries in my deck because I may need it at a later time. The next card that I'm going to be focusing on is Ironworks. This is just an absolutely core card for Swedes. It's so important that you've got this card in your deck. It increases the gather rate of Torps on Coin Mines by 150%. It's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, the next two cards that you're going to be looking at cause for all European civilizations, the factories. You might not get to the industrial age in all of your games. You probably only get there 10% of your games. But when you do, you're going to need factories. Factories are the backbone of your industrial economy. They have a huge gather rate on them. And by not taking them, you're going to miss out. All right. So there are permanent cards for this, uh, for, for the Cathedral, for the Military Academy, and for the New World Trading Company. So when it comes to economy, I don't take any of these cards for... Uh, for every single game. There's, there's no permanent cards in here. 
I do include a lot of these cards in my deck, especially in my team game decks, but as a permanent card, these are much more flexible. Finally, the harbour. Now for Sweden, Sweden has a big focus on mercenaries, and me in particular, I'm a big fan of them. I absolutely love the mercenaries, so I make sure that I include in all of my deck the Jaegers and the Black Riders. Swedes don't have particularly strong anti-cavalry. The anti-cavalry that they do have, the Pikeman and the Krolian, they're not as fast as the Black Rider. So it's important that you've got them in your deck so that you're able to manage anti-cavalry in the mid game and that if it goes late game, you've got something that you can chase raids away with. These are my permanent cards. I include all of these cards in all of my decks. Now, let's move on to the first deck that we're going to be looking at. So this is the deck that you're going to be using most often. So it is for 1v1 and it's for land maps. So it's a very general deck. So well, what we might do is we might actually copy from the permanent cards, seeing as we... Uh, seeing as we're going to be using them all. So, for 1v1, it's important that you're flexible, which is why you're going to include three settlers. Three settlers is going to enable you to determine, you know, if if you're up against a rush, you're normally going to want to play three settlers instead of blueberries. So, that's the first thing. Uh, Next card you're going to be looking at is uh, 700 coin. This is a card that I very rarely send, but in the games where I do actually want to fast fortress as the Swedes, it's a card that is, you know, it's imperative to have. Even though your Torps have a massive gather rate when it comes, it allows you to uh, to easily hit that 1,000 gold to age up, and then it gives you a little bit of a buffer to work towards the first shipment in Fortress Age, which is almost always going to be mercenaries, whether that's the Black Riders, get them out on the map raiding, whether that's the Jaegers to start contributing towards that mass, it's almost always going to be the mercenaries. So those are definitely the big ones on this page. You're also going to want to include 1,000 wood. 1,000 wood is an incredibly strong card. It's going to enable you to build your your town centers. It's going to enable you to um, get upgrades from the arsenal. It's a card that's really, really strong in one versus one. So next page we're going to be looking at, the Military Academy. So I want to talk a little bit about the difference between 1v1 and team game mindsets. So when it comes to the team games, you've got two or three players that are contributing towards this ball of units. So naturally, if you ship five Hussar, you're contributing five Hussar to a much larger ball than if it was a 1v1, where you've only got one player contributing to it. As a result, in one versus one, you're going to include a lot more unit shipments in your deck than you would unit upgrades. In team games, you're going to include a lot more upgrades and a lot less unit shipments. So, now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about what kind of unit shipments we're going to be including. The first thing is the cavalry. As Sweden, you're normally going to get a barracks down pretty early, but often you can neglect cavalry. So we're going to stick five hussars in there. We're also going to stick five hakapella in there. So the next card that you're going to be including in your deck from this page is going to be the team heavy infantry hit points. This is going to increase the hit points of your Corollians. Now the Corollians, you're going to be using them to charge a lot in game, so it's important that their hit points are as high as possible. The fact that this is available in the second age is a really strong card, uh, and it's important that you, you get this one out nice and early where you've got the option to send it. Moving on to the Cathedral. So we're going to be picking up the dominions card now dominions is an incredibly strong card in my opinion in one versus one in team games it's not so strong now the reason why dominions is an incredibly strong card is it allows you to build four torps without having to move any settlers so there might be a a mine that's on the other side of the map you can then task those torps uh, the torp wagons to move all the way around the outside of the map shift clicking them around and then build those torps It also allows them to receive shipments. So what you can do is you can go do a sneaky little torp up outside the enemy's base. And then once you've hit age three, you're able to ship in your cavalry and you've got a very nice drop in point. So it's, it's a very, uh, it's a very versatile card. And it's a card that I do like to use, especially when you're under a lot of pressure early game. It's really nice to just be able to put down four torps and, and not really have to worry about them, especially when you've got the blueberries card, they're always going to be gathering a heap of food. If you can stick them on coin mines, then especially they're going to be working wonders for you, even though they're only 480 resources. You know, four tops, 120 times four, 480, quick math. 
it's the bonus that you get from them and the ease that it allows you to uh, to have is just a really, really important thing. So the next card is Infantry Train Time. So Fencing School. Fencing School is a card, let's just get him over here. Fencing School is a card that is a little bit controversial. A lot of people will say that don't include it in your deck, just build more barracks. Uh, but the problem is until you hit the industrial age, you're not going to be able to train mercenaries out of your barracks or out of your stables. So you're going to include the fencing school card. It's going to enable you to train your Jaegers out of your saloon a lot faster once you hit that third age. So it's it's a really important card that I get it. When I like to play Sweden, I really, really like to include it in my decks. All right. So the next card that we're going to be including in the deck is the Treaty of Roskilde. So this is the unique church card for the Swedes. This is an incredibly strong card for your Jaegers. So the reason why it's such a strong card is it gives them plus 10% health. Now Jaegers start with 250 health, so that takes them up to 275 health. Keep in mind that they've also got 40% range resistance, which just increases that health even further when they're in, in the middle of skirmisher wars. It's a really, really important card uh, to have in your deck. Uh, it also includes a speed upgrade for your pikemen, which is something that we're going to be talking about a little bit later on when we get to the harbour page of the deck. So the next card, so we're, we're all finished for the second age. Now we're just going to be focusing on what happens in the mid game and what's going to be happening in the late game. So moving on to the manufacturing plan, this is where all of our economic cards are. There's only really one card from here that we're going to be looking at, uh, and that is the um, the Royal Mint. The Royal Mint is the, is the primary one that you want, and that's just going to increase the gather rate that your villagers have on coin mines. Uh, but just looking at my deck, I realize that I've, I've actually skipped an important card. So we're going to head back to the Military Academy. I just want to have a chat about that. So, oh, sorry, it's in the Cathedral. Uh, it is the Ten Spies card. This card is absolutely incredible. Once you've hit the Third Age, so assuming that, you know, you, you're broken out into an FF war, you're against uh, someone who's got a two Falk shipment, maybe it's the Brits, maybe it's the Spanish, they're going to ship two Falks, you're going to ship two Falks, but you're going to ship ten Spies, and then you're going to use your Spies to flank their Falconets. Spies do not a lot of damage, but when you've got ten of them, and they're all on top of a Falconet, and they're, they're killing it, because keep in mind these Spies can go invisible, they're just absolutely going to demolish it nice and quickly so yeah very important card to have in the deck so moving back uh let's have a look uh we're going to hit the final page of the mercenaries so we've got three card spots left in our decks so what are we going to do with them so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to include swiss pikemen so i love to play a game uh, around Jaegers uh, and mercenaries. But the problem with Jaegers is obviously they, um, they're they not anti-cavalry, even though some people will argue that they are. Uh, the Swiss Pike, on the other hand, incredibly strong unit. Uh, it's it's just going to, you know, three-shot uh, Hussar. The Black Riders, while they're good, uh, that, you know, sometimes you just really need that front line against, uh, against the enemy and the Swiss Pike are what provide it. Um, even though you do have the option, instead of the Swiss Pike, to go for the Highlander, uh, I just find that the, the Swiss Pike fill the role of anti-cavalry significantly better. The next two cards that I'm going to be taking, and I take in almost all of my decks, is the Infinite Mameluke card. This is a, a huge card. So once you hit age four, there's nothing better than just shipping this card, watching the enemy push in, and then, you know, these absolute beasts with, you know, thousands of health, just mop them all up. It, it's a wonderful card, and it's a, it's a very important inclusion in, in most of my decks, in my team decks and my 1v1 decks. And the final card in the deck is going to be German Mercenary Contracts. So this not only is going to increase the health and the attack of your mercenaries, but it's also going to enable you to train your units in barracks and stables, uh, and it's also going to enable the Landschnack. Uh, so Landschnack, it's not particularly a, a strong unit. It's basically a, a doppel that doesn't have any form of AOE. So it's, uh, it's. I, I guess the best way to look at it, it's probably more like a halberdier now that I think about it. Uh, and, and halberdiers, well, you guys know what my thoughts are on halberdiers. Um, so yeah, it, it's probably just best that you, you avoid training those. So that concludes the 1v1 land deck. The next deck that you're going to be uh, looking at is a, a deck variation. So 
the idea with the deck variation is that you're going to keep the the same strategy in mind but you're just going to change a tactic that you're using so for me my strategy with the swedes is that i'm going to build up my economy early i'm going to make sure that i can survive a rush i'm going to try and get to the fortress age where i'm going to ship jaegers and then once i'm in the fortress age i'm going to build up a solid mass of mercenaries and then i'm going to try and hit the fourth age where i'm then able to ship my mercenary card including so german mercenary contracts and then get my factories out normally i try and hit the the fourth age by about 14 to 15 minutes which is is quite early and it does take a lot of people by surprise um, if, if I do get pushed, instead of sending these these cards, I'll be making sure I send my Mamelukes, because six Mamelukes is just incredibly difficult to deal with at that point in the game. So we're not really going to change a lot in this deck. The main thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking out a, um, a unit shipment. So let me get that one out, out of the way. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking out a unit shipment from the third age, and we're going to be moving our uh, we're taking a first age card instead so the first variation that we're going to be doing it's called 1v1 land defense so for the swedes you might be coming up against a rush and you're thinking all right you know everything's going fine i've got my 14 vills that i'm aging up with or 15 vills or however many you want to age up with uh you know i i've got my my unit shipments i'm going to be fine problem maybe you didn't get your barracks up in time how are you going to react? What are you going to do? What, what's the way that you're going to, to make the situation better for yourself? And so the trick is you're going to add in a card, which used to be known as Colonial Militia. It's now known as Town Militia because 2020 got it. So that means that we're going to have to be, we're going to have to take a card out of this deck. And we're going to have to have to put in a town militia so the question is which card is the one that you're going to take out so for me even though i love my swiss pikes it's something that it's it's not mandatory black riders do serve your purpose for anti-cavalry so when i'm looking at this deck i'm thinking in all the situations you know swiss pikemen excuse me i'm just going to take a drink delicious so the swiss pikemen have their role as that front line but they can be replaced so we're going to remove them from the deck and we're just going to stick town militia in and that's it that's literally our land defense deck done the reason why we need this deck is because if you don't have this deck and 15 genissaries are in your base sieging your house who are you going to call well you're not going to call the town militia that's for sure because you don't have the card in your deck that's why it's, it's really important that understanding the the concept of, of deck variants uh is important that you can have a deck and still stick to a strategy but you can change it up just a little bit by including this in in a normal game i'm not going to be wanting that card you know if i'm against the portuguese i'm not going to be using that card at all but I, i'm definitely going to be using swiss pikemen but i'm not going to be using town militia so let's move on to our next so this is where we change up the strategy a little bit where we're actually going to be focusing on the boom side of things so instead of going and, and choosing a, a land deck we're just going to go back to our permanent cards and we're going to copy this so we're going to create a new deck called 1v1 boom so this is a deck that i would be using in let's say you spawn on or the the map is siberia and siberia you spawn with a coin mine that has a an outpost guarding it so typically people are more hesitant to rush on Siberia because if you do rush not only are you going to be up against the town center you're going to be up against a free tower that the enemy got and the same uh, thing happens on the map Texas where you actually spawn with two outposts so in that situation when you spawn on those maps it's important to be aware that the game is going to play a lot differently it's going to be played a lot more relaxed in, in the early game there's going to be a big focus on the mid game so it's important that you're thinking about you know what cards you want in your deck to make sure that you're able to 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 leverage that that knowledge so as an example if we were to take you know the land deck here a, a lot of these cards they're not going to be as useful to a game that's going to be focused around the economy so as an example these unit shipments we probably don't need all of these unit shipments so it's important that with the, the boom deck what we're going to do is we're going to focus on um you know making sure that 
uh, the unit shipment deck the unit shipments that we've got in our deck are, are crucial unit shipments and and that really is it we're going to make sure that we stick a lot more upgrades in our deck in, as well so let's have a look so we're going to chuck in 700 gold uh just because we're probably going to hit the the fortress age as soon as possible we don't have to send it but it's always nice just in case we want to get it there extra quick obviously we're going to throw in a thousand wood it's a really really important card uh, the next thing is the military academy so I, I still think it's important that you do include unit shipments in your deck it's probably just that you don't need to include as much unit shipments um, so there we've got you can see we've got the, the two sets of cavalry now when it comes to booming i play the game a little bit differently so if you are in a boom so that means that uh, as the swedes you're just going to be pumping out an absolute shitload of torps and then hitting the third age you're going to be building up an excess of food really really quickly and Corolians just aren't going to cut it their food to coin ratio is way too low because you're going to be spending coin on mercs you need to be spending your food on something as well now obviously you're going to be building three town centers in a boom game but that third thing that you're going to be looking for it's the Hussar. The Hussar is a really food heavy unit. The uh, Swedes get a huge amount of upgrades for it. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go and smack a whole bunch of Hussar upgrades in this deck. So Hussar upgrade, Hussar upgrade, Hussar upgrade. I think this is the one that we want. Yeah, that's the one that we want. We don't want this one. So we're just going to smash all of those in our deck. And the reason why is because once we hit that set of that third age, we're going to have a massive influx of food gonna have 20 torps they're all gonna be smashing out blueberries you know your settlers they're probably not all gonna be on wood you're gonna have a couple that are on food so it's important that you've got these cards in your deck because when you build up that massive hussars you want to make sure that they're doing damage and so that's why we're, we're going to include those cards so moving on to the cathedral so in this instance we're not going to be including uh the fencing school card so the fencing school card was something that we had in the in the last two decks uh we don't need it in this deck and the reason why is because we're focusing on hussars so even though it's still important that we're able to get out our units on time at the same time we need to be understanding that our units are going to be a mix and because they're going to be a mix we don't we don't really need to focus it so we're not going to be taking the fencing school but we are going to be taking dominions as i said dominions is an absolutely wonderful card and we're also going to be taking the the treaty so the the unique church card The Ten Spies, it's a must. You need to have this when, when you've got your two Falconets pushing in. you got to have this card because it, it's just going to, you know, absolutely knock them out. And they're going to get absolutely frustrated. So, very important card to have in the deck. And then, moving on, I, I think that's all we need from, from this side. And moving down to the manufacturing plant. So because it's a boom game, we're going to be sticking the Royal Mint in. Now, obviously, Royal Mint was included in our in our land deck as well um, but with the boom the idea is that even though we're, we're calling it boom really it's it's more about strategy that and and the idea behind it that we're focusing a bit more on unit upgrades than we are on and and, and on economy rather than economy upgrades so that's what we're going to take from the manufacturing plant and then finally with the harbor we're going to include those swiss pikemen again and we're going to include our mamelukes and we're going to be getting our mercenary contracts Oh, no, we're not. I guess the question is, what have I included that I I can go without? And so this is one of those rare occasions where we're actually going to be removing one of our permanent cards from the deck. So it it is a not so permanent, and that's, that's the pikemen. And the reason why we're not going to be removing that is because the pikemen, ideally, you're going to be using them for anti-cavalry in the second age. And while you still might be up against raids... In, in a map like Siberia or on Texas, you're not going to be needing to use pikemen. The Corolians are going to serve an anti-cavalry purpose that's significant enough for you that you're not going to need to include those in your deck in this case. So we're going to take the pikemen out and we're going to include the German mercenary contracts. This is going to enable us to have a late game which focuses on mercenaries and at the same time focuses on having very strong cavalry. It's important to note that these cards do actually increase the hit points and the damage of the Mameluke. This one does not because it only increases Hussar. And this one also only increases the Hussar. So it's these two here. 
So moving on to the next deck that we're going to be making. So we've covered the, the land boom. So now we're going to be looking at the water. So let's go back to the permanent cards. Actually, we can we can essentially take it from our, our land deck. The water deck is, is very, very similar to the land deck. There's only a few minor changes. So what we're going to do now, there, there's a couple of different type of types of water decks. This deck is going to be a little bit different from the one I'm going to create called Water Boom. So I'm sure I've given you given it away. So water is a it's a complicated area of the map and not a lot of people like to venture there. But the problem is once your opponent ventures there, do you just let him sit there? Do you just let him have all the water to himself? You could be taking that away from him. And that's what this deck is designed to do. You know, if, if you don't want to get your feet wet, that's absolutely fine. But it doesn't mean that you can't sit on the side of the pool and throw oranges at the guy. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So the first thing that we're going to be looking to add into the deck, trying to squeeze in, is the two caravels card. It's a really important card that's going to enable you to have early, uh, early control over the water and at least, you know, have your foot in the door for a fighting chance. So the question is, how do you take it out or how do, how do you find space in the deck? So we're going to start by removing the team hand or heavy infantry hit points. We're going to get that one out of there. We're also going to need space for four privateers. This is a really strong mercenary card uh, and it's going to enable you to basically take the, the full control of the water in the third age. So how do we get or how do we find space in the deck for that? And that comes with this the 10 spies, even though it's a really, really strong card. It's important that we have the option to have water control. So we're going to stick that one in. And then we're going to put the caravels in. Now with the water boom deck, that's going to be looking significantly different. So the water boom deck, we might as well start from scratch with that one. So we're going to call this 1v1 water boom. All right. So the primary thing that we're going to be needing because because we're doing a water boom is water orientated cards. So no water boom deck is is complete without schooners. Very, very important card. We're also going to be including the upgrades for the water. So rendering plant is the most important one. It gives an upgrade for both fish and for the whale. And it's more than the 25% the the fish market gives. Even though whale oil gives 35%, it's only for the oil. And so for 1v1, it's important that you're very limited with how many economic upgrades you're putting into your deck, which is why we're only going to include rendering plant. There are some certain situations where you would put all three, but I never would do that for Sweden. Maybe as the Portuguese, that's probably the only time I'd put all three. And that's because they have such a strong water presence that you can really get away with abusing all three of those cards and still being able to win the game without, an, without a single hitch. So with our the next cards that we're going to be focusing on the Water Boom deck, so we're going to make sure that we've got our Privateers and we're going to make sure that we've got our Caravels. Just like in the water, uh, the water deck that we did earlier, it's important that we we maintain that in our water boom deck. So, the next thing that that's coming up. So, you, you, it, it's important that you think in the uh, holistically about how a water game plays out. If you're going to be booming on the water, it means you're going to be getting a lot of extra resources, so food and and coin. Normally, it's going to be a fair bit more coin than usual um, but in the early game it's going to start out as food so we're going to use that same concept that we used in the 1v1 boom and we're going to make sure that we include the unit upgrades uh, for our cavalry so that's the unit upgrades for our cavalry we're also going to include the fin horses as well as the trample tactics so that will give us the extra hp on our hussars the next thing that we're going to be doing is uh, including the church card. So the church card is just one of those cards that it's really, really important that you've got this in your deck, um, especially for, for your Jaegers and for your Swiss Pikes, because as, as you guessed it, coming up right now, it's our Swiss Pikes. There it is. So in addition to that, we'll obviously include the German mercenary contracts and the six Mamelukes. And then the question really comes down to what do you include in the third age? So for the third age, I prefer to go a thousand wood. And then this last card, it's a little bit more difficult because your options are, are wide open. But keep in mind that when you're booming, you're going to be having a lot more resources coming in. And as a consequence of having more resources in, 
you're adding units with unit shipments to a larger mass when you could be adding upgrades instead. So a boom game plays a little bit more like a team game. But either way, we're still going to go and we're going to include the five hacker pellets. This is, um, you know, hacker pellets are, are, are a strong unit, really good to have behind a, a frontline FSR. So I'm going to go or start by including those in the deck as well. So that's that's the water boom deck. That's the water deck. That's the water boom deck. Notice that we've taken out the Royal Mint card. We don't need that card because we're going to be having our fishing boats who are going to be on our uh, on, on the whales. Now, if, if I, I would just caveat this by saying if you're playing on a map where there's no whales and there's only uh, fish present, I probably wouldn't take a water boom deck. Even though you can probably see an advantage to having schooners in the deck, it's not an infinite bonus. And for me as a player i often theorize that i'm I, I will take the game as late as possible and allow my economy to win but if i'm taking the game as late as possible it means that i'm going to be wasting one or two cards on an investment and i'm not going to see a return on that over the entire game it's it's a finite resource and that's something that i want to inv avoid investing in so the next thing that we're going to be doing is a deck variant for this so We've, we've covered what the water boom looks like. We've covered what the 1v1 on the water looks like. So what do you do if you're playing against an Ottoman and you see he's got heaps of unit resource crates. You see he's got five gens. You see he's got three hussars all in his deck. But then he's also got schooners in his deck. That's that you know that's that's where you're you're sort of stuck with a problem. Do you go one v one water or do you go one v one land defense? You're going to need colonial militia to defend you know the Janissary rush. But you're going to need your caravels to deal with his fishing boats if he ever starts to make them. So that's where we make our variant. So we're going to go and we're going to make a deck variant. We're going to call it 1v1 water defense. All right. So now the, the hard part for this is finding the right card to take out because we know that we only need to include one card. That's it. So the card of choice for me in this situation Eeny, meeny, miny, mi no, I'm just kidding. It's the Swiss pike again. Unfortunately for the Swiss pikeman, he's just not uh, he's just not Swiss enough to join the Swedish team on our water defense maps. So we're going to get rid of him. We're going to be putting in town militia. It's going to enable us to put up a strong defense. So the final thing that I want to talk about is who gets to see your deck. So it's not just you who has access to your deck. The enemy has access to your deck as well. And just like a Facebook advertisement, you know, what does your deck say about you? It's a really good question. So I'm, I'm going to switch civilizations. We're going to go from Swedes over to the Portuguese. And I've prepared a couple of decks that I'd like you to take a look at. So this is the first deck. So let's say that you, you pop into a game... You know, the map is Patagonia. Patagonia is probably a good example because uh, for the Portuguese, you know, they've got the option of water, but they've also got the option of trade routes. And that's obviously what this Portuguese has done. So the Portuguese have been given a new age up politician, the logistician, which I'm going to be covering very shortly in a new video. And this politician allows them to fight very early with their town centers. So the town centers are allowed to construct military units so they can construct musketeers and crossbowmen and because of this it allows them to put out a lot early pressure so when you're you know in matchmaking and you're up against the portuguese and the map is patagonia thinking all right is he going to water boom is he going to take the trading posts is he going to musket rush me what's he going to do and you open up his deck and you have a look at this well guess what he's just answered your question now you know exactly what he's going to do you know that he's probably going to take the trading post. You know he's not going to be on water. And you know for sure there's absolutely no way he's going to be musket rushing you. So, you are allowed to prepare for that. It means that you can take the deck that you need to take. Now, Portuguese might be a bad example because Portuguese often won't take a card in the first stage. Sometimes they do take a card like Schooners or they might take Economic Theory. Uh, but more often than not, they actually don't take a card. So, for the sake of the argument... I'd just like you to bear with me. That's So the Portuguese has very clearly telegraphed his strategy with what he's going to do. If he was going to have this deck, though, and you were coming up against him, you would be 
significantly more curious about what strategy he was going to go for. Now, you know that he wouldn't be going for water because there's no schooners. Or if he is going for water, he's not going to be doing it big league. He's only going to be going little league. But guess what, my friend? He could be going for an FI, just like the previous deck. He's still got three unit shipment cards in this deck that are going to change the tide of battle. Five organs, two heavy cannons, and that's six veteran dragoons and six casadors. Even though he hasn't telegraphed it, he's still able to do that strategy. It still allows him to play exactly the cards that he needs. He starts, he hops into the game, he might ship Economic Theory first. The second card he ships, it's going to be House of Braganza. The third card he ships, it might be 700 coin. The fourth card that he ships, it might be his Fortress. The fifth card he ships, two heavy cannons. And they're looking down at your town center and they're knocking on its door. You can achieve the exact same thing without telegraphing your strategy. So, if you are going to create your deck around going for a certain strategy, keep in mind that you're not the only player who's going to be seeing your deck. The enemy player is also going to be seeing your deck. I hope that you've been able to take something away from this video. While I've only covered 1v1 in this video, in the next video that I release, I'm going to be aiming to cover team games as well. Team games play out significantly different from 1v1s, it's an, but it's important that you're equally as flexible in team games as you are in 1v1s. Thank you very much for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel, as I'm going to be having much more content like this coming up in the future. Thank you for watching.